Uh, we're going to begin a new series this morning that we are entitling uh, Thy Will Be Done. Thy Will Be Done. Let me just say from the very beginning, I need you to think carefully and deeply with me uh, this morning through this message, all right? Let's pray together. Lord, um, we just heard a song, a beautiful song, uh, right out of Scripture uh, that is an invitation for you to create in us a clean heart. We know, God, that we can't do it in and of ourselves. We need you to do in us what is impossible with us. And that's one of the reasons why, God, uh, we come to study your word, uh, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. It's why we pray. It's, it's why we give and serve, because we know, God, that those are just avenues that we can travel down for your grace to work in our life. And we thank you, God, that you've given to us this opportunity um, to hear the teaching of your word. And I pray that both for teacher and for those that listen, that, God, our hearts would be open to what your Holy Spirit would whisper to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen. Have you ever gotten lost in a strange place? Uh, I remember uh, a bunch of years ago, 10, 12, 14 years ago, uh, Cheryl and I took our boys out west for what I lovingly call the obligatory out west trip. And uh, it took 28 days off, uh, one of the longest periods of time I'd ever been gone from here. And uh, we loaded up in a, an extended van that Cheryl's parents owned, and we made our way all the way out west to New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota. And we saw some of the greatest parks in the world, the, the national parks, Grand Canyon, Mesa Verde, uh, the Grand Tetons, Yellowstone, the Badlands, and many, many others. It was a once-in-a-lifetime trip. So when we got out of South Dakota, we decided that we would go into Chicago. We had been in the wilderness, so we decided to go into the urban center. And uh, we went to Chicago. We spent one day there. And, and then from there, <clears throat> we decided we would drive 180 miles from Chicago to Indianapolis, Indiana, to visit Cheryl's aging grandmother. I figured this would be a great way for us to kind of finish up our family vacation. And so we got up early that morning in Chicago, and remember, Chicago has 8 million people that live in it, all right? A little bigger than Cape Coral, all right? 8 million people. And I got on the interstate, I, no kidding, it had to have been 8 or 10 lanes going each way. And I got onto the interstate and accidentally went the wrong way. God is my witness. It took one hour to make a U-turn. And... Jesus-loving Pastor George was not very Jesus-loving, all right? It was a bad day in the Acevedo household, all right? I'm trying to navigate this, this, this van through eight or ten lanes of traffic just to turn around. It took us an hour to make a U-turn. Now, it's a tragic thing when you get lost on a trip, but it's even more a tragic thing when you get lost in your life. Can somebody say amen? Amen, amen. amen. it really is. It's really tragic when we get lost in our life. And here's the deal. God wants us all to be found. That's the deepest desire of God's heart for you and for me. There are more than 7 billion people on this planet. And let me just tell you, down to the core of who I am, I believe that God has amazing plans for all 7 billion people on this planet. And guess what, friends? That includes you. God has amazing plans. He, he has an amazing plan for your life, and, and it begins with following Jesus. You see, the way that a person moves from being lost to being found is by trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. The Bible tells us that the one thing that separates us as human beings from a holy God is our sin. It's when we choose our own way. And when we come to that place in our life where we say to God, God, I'm tired of being lost. I want to be found. And we say, Jesus, I'm tired of being driven by the sin in my life, and I want you to take care of that. What he did on the cross, when we by faith put our trust in him, what he did on the cross becomes ours. And we move from the lost category to the found category. But it doesn't end there. And whether that for you took a moment or took, took a season, it doesn't end when you say the sinner's prayer or when you get up from an altar like this from praying and saying, Jesus, find me, change my life. As a matter of fact, it just begins. I think the best part of following Jesus 
is after you've said Jesus come into your life. And you begin to, out of, out of obedience to him, radical obedience to him, you begin to say, Jesus, I want you to, to lead my life in, in every way. I, I want to have what Eugene Peterson said. I want to have a long obedience in the same direction. That just simply out of gratitude for what Jesus did for me on the cross, out of gratitude, I want to say, Jesus, I want to obey you because you did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And so you want to know, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Those first disciples, they wanted to know what it meant to follow Jesus. And one day they went up to the master, to the rabbi, to Jesus, and they said, Rabbi, would you teach us to pray? And Jesus gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer, a model prayer. And there are lots of petitions in there, lots of requests that are made in the Lord's Prayer. But one of those is found in Matthew 6, 9. I I put it in the King James Version because that's the one most of us know. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven, yeah. And here's what the Master has said. He said, if you want to follow me, part of what you need to pray is about God's will. And not just God's will in heaven, but God's will where? On earth. And how's it going to get lived out on earth? Through God's people. Jesus said one of the things that we need to do is to discover and to do God's will. And it's not optional. You see, it's it's not just inconvenient when a Christ follower gets lost. It's tragic. In my experience, after 35 years of being a follower of Jesus and 25 years of being a pastor, is that there are lots of us as followers of Jesus that don't know his will for our life. We're lost. That's why for the next four weeks we're going to talk about the will of God in this series, Thy Will Be Done. Some of you will remember that last spring we asked you, what do you want us to teach about here? And this one was right right near the top. It was like number one or two. Of what people who call Grace Church their spiritual home said they wanted us to teach on is, God, how how do I know what you want me to do? How do I know what your will is? And there were a lot of questions about, is it God's will when we go through tragedy? And how does all of that work together when it doesn't appear to be good and yet we're going through it? So we're going to try to answer some of those questions out of God's word. Now let me just say from the very beginning that if you're not a Christ follower that this morning I would invite you to, to listen to this message. And let me just tell you what my prayer has been, that if you're not a Christ follower this morning, that this morning some of your questions will be answered, but more importantly, that today would be the day that you'd say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to place my trust in what he did for me on the cross. I want to follow him. If you're a Christ follower, I want to invite you not to miss a single Sunday over the next four weeks. Because these these teachings on God's will could revolutionize your life. You could move from from being kind of wandering as a Christ follower into following him in a life of obedience. So the Christ follower who's on the road to obedience with Jesus knows that there's this fundamental question that he or she asks every day. It's not in your notes, but it is on the screen. Is it going to be my will be done or thy will be done. Isn't this true? Isn't this true? If you're a Christ follower, this is a question you ask all the time. Is it going to be my will be done or thy will be done? So you're at work, and and there becomes an opportunity that crosses your path, comes across your desk. If I just cheat a little bit, if I just lie a little bit, I can get ahead in my job. And you ask yourself this question, God, is it my will or your will? Which am I going to choose? You're a married person. And somebody uh, in your life who is not your spouse begins to give you a little bit of attention, getting a little sweet on you. And you have to ask yourself the question, is it going to be my will or is it going to be thy will? You hear what I just said about 10 minutes ago in this worship service about learning to to engage with God and being generous with your financial resources and tithing and, and giving beyond the tithe. And within our head comes up this little voice that says, There's, i got to have more. And we have to ask ourselves every day, is it going to be my will or is it going to be thy will? Which is it, which is it going to be? You see, this is real everyday stuff for everyday, ordinary followers of Jesus. That's why we're doing this series. Because every follower of Jesus who wants to live a life of obedience asks this question many times a day. 
So we're going to begin <clears throat> with a sermon that we've entitled, God's Will Defined. We're going to get real, real basic. Now, <clears throat> I uh, told the teaching team this week when we met, I said, you know, I wish I, wish I could find a, a, a book in the Bible called God's Will. Just flip to it. Need to know what to do with my job? Uh, that's chapter 6 of God's Will. Look, look it up. Good. Oh, there it is. I don't know what to do. Anybody found that book in the Bible yet? No, it ain't there, right? It doesn't exist. But what the Bible does is it tells stories and it has teachings that the wise follower of Jesus has learned to mine out biblical principles that guide their life. And so this week, I mean, we had some serious conversation in the teaching team on Tuesday. And we mined out um, what we're calling three things Christ followers need to know about God's will. They're found in the pages of Scripture, and it seems to be that these are enduring, eternal principles. So here they are. Number one, God's will is often hard to figure out. It's often hard to figure out. When, when I was in my 20s, I'd hear these old people in their 50s. Okay, I'm 52, all right? When I was in my 20s, I'd hear these old people in their 50s saying, the older I get, the less I know. And arrogantly, I'd say, you guys are just stupid. But now that I'm in my 50s and a grandfather of three, which, which by the way, Seth was born, show him the picture. There's my boy. That's right. Notice there's two people there with chubby cheeks. <laughs> seven pounds, seven ounces, uh, 21 inches, born at 601 on Thursday. Mom and dad are coming home today with little Seth. Okay, back to the message. All right, back to the message. You know I'd slip that in there somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. God's will is often hard to, to figure out. See, what I've discovered, remember I said when I, 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 I was so cocksured of myself when I was a kid, you know, hey, what do you mean the older you get, the less you I think the older you get, the more you know. But I know that it's true, at least in my life. Time and experience have tempered my life. Let me just tell you uh, the other side to that deal. My core convictions I hold to tighter than ever. But there are just a lot less hills I'm willing to die on. Uh, you can ask uh, some of my friends who've been with us from the very beginning. I would fight over everything about Grace Church when I got here. Now, pff, I don't really care about much, as long as we stay on mission. That's the only thing I really care about. Let's stay on mission. Let's do what God's asked us to do. And so, I mean, what, when it comes to God's will, I mean, the reality is, is it's not easy to figure out. The Bible tells us that this sense of being humble about God's will is a good place, a good thing. This humility of heart is a very, very good thing. See, our humanity, listen to me, our humanity has limitations. You and I don't know everything. We don't. And, and we, can, we can be arrogant like I was in my 20s about knowing everything, or, or we can have humility. It's interesting that when the Apostle Paul is teaching about agape, unconditional, God's reckless love for us that we're supposed to have for each other, he includes in there a lesson about being humble. Listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. Read this last line with me. Ready? Go. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Underline the phrase, all that I know now is what? Partial and all means, that's right. And he says, all that I know when? Now. You know, he says, there's going to come a time when I'll know things completely. But right now, we only know partially. You see, sin limits our understanding. That's why uh, figuring out God's will for our life is often hard to do. When I was uh, 21 and first starting to work in youth ministry, I thought that the parents of the kids in our youth ministry were awful, awful parents. I was judgmental about them. I was going like, oh, just let me raise your kid. And then God gave me a dose of humility in two children. Right? 
And the list goes on and on and on of lessons that I've had to learn. So let's go back to God's will and apply this principle to it. It's flat out hard, not impossible, to figure out God's will. In my 35 years of walking with Jesus, I can name on one hand the number of times I've had a burning bush experience where I stood uh, before God and God told me to do something and it was crystal clear. 35 years, less than five. Most of the time, it's taken, it's taken uh, a sense of humility, of trust, of looking for wise counsel, of looking to his word. We're going to talk about that next week, of how do you discern, how do you determine what God's will is. Listen to me, men, husbands, most of the time, I know, no, all of the time, I know God's will for my wife more than I know God's will for my life. Amen? Brothers, come on now, don't, I know some of you don't be leaving me hanging, right? Okay. Some of you brothers, I ain't saying that. My wife's sitting next to me, right? Okay, I get you. Cheryl's at the next service. I'll leave it out. So, <laughs> yeah, there have been very few burning bush experiences. Very few. There's this Bible verse. You know it, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Now, remember that in the time that that was written, during the time of Solomon, they had those little genie-like clay pots that they used as lamps. There were three ropes attached to that lamp that went up to a single knot. It was about three feet length of rope, and it held down by your feet. And they would light the lamp filled with oil, and they would walk in the dark. And how far could they see in front of them? One step. Here's why I believe God doesn't give us the road map for his will for our life. If God gave us the road map, we'd trust the map and not him. And so here's what God says to us. He says, I'm going to give you, most of the time, when it comes to my will for your life, I'm going to give you enough light for the next step. Why? So that you'll trust me for the next one and the next one and the next one. So let's be honest. The Bible says that God's will is not always easy to figure out. Here's the second principle. Number two, God's will never violates his character. It never violates his character. Whether you've been in church a long time or this is your first time, you've heard of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, recently I heard somebody say it's the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions, right? And one of those ten, on God's top ten list, number three, Exodus 20, verse 7a says, read this with me, ready, go, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. So the real question is, what does this mean? Is it, is it, is it when I put the D word after God? Is that what it means? Well, now listen. The Bible, both Old and New Testaments, speaks a lot about the words that come out of our mouth. About the volume, the, 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 the quantity, the quality, uh, the, 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 the intent of the words that come out of our mouth. So surely it means something to do with the words that we use to to describe God or, or, or damning his name. But let me just say this. There's a deeper meaning that we often lose in this Bible translation or in this Bible interpretation. You see, um, I think that we misuse the name of God when we ascribe to God, when we get credit to God for things that aren't in keeping with God's character. I've been using this phrase this week to describe it. Call it God slandering. God slandering. What is slander? I looked it up in the dictionary, and slander means defamation. It means to speak words about somebody that aren't true. So if you said, Pastor George um, robbed a bank, that would be slander. Because I haven't. Not yet. I'm still alive, right? But I, that's, that's defamation. That's, that's slander. So what does that mean for God? Uh, a dear friend loses a young child tragically to death. And you want to offer comfort as a Christ follower, and you unintentionally, with no real malice, you put your arm around your friend, and you just whisper these words, it must have been God's will. 
And I've been there when it's been done. Or this one, God needed another angel. Listen to me, God doesn't need any more angels. And God doesn't kill babies. God's heart is broken. I have friends in this church who have lost their children. And God's heart, listen to me, mom, dad, those of you that have lost a loved one in a tragic kind of a way way too soon, I want to say to you, it is not God's will. And here in a little bit, I'll try to share with you some insights that might, might help you, but it's, it's, not, it's not God's will. I, I, I had, a, I had a, a friend, about this was like 13, 14 years ago. Church was much smaller. I would teach every Sunday and every Wednesday, and I was teaching a Bible study, and in the Bible study, the issue, it's much smaller, it's a group of about 70 or 80 of us, and in the Bible study, somebody raised the issue of capital punishment. Now, your pastor's perspective is that capital punishment is wrong. Now, this is just my perspective. Uh, and, I, and here's how I come to that conclusion. Um, I think that God thinks all of life is precious, whether it's an unborn child or whether it's a guilty murderer. I think God thinks that every life is redeemable and every life has value. Now, I understand our need for exacting punishment and revenge, and I'm not bright enough. You have to get a lot smarter pastor to navigate through all of that. So my friend and I were having this discussion after the Bible study, and we were having a Christ-like disagreement, okay? This was not intense fellowship, all right? He wasn't ready to punch me in the face and leave the church. He was a good friend, and we were disagreeing. And listen to me, and I, you know, I, I, I'm a big Facebook guy, and, I, and I'm all into social media, and I've been watching all the stuff around the election and Chick-fil-A and all that stuff. I just wish we could learn to disagree agreeably. Here's what John Wesley said, and I love this. I wrote this quote because I wanted you to hear this. John Wesley said, in essentials, unity. Those core things we fight about, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity or love. So my friend and I are having this discussion, and I said, you know, I'm trying to win the argument. I said to the guy, and he's trying to win it back. So please hear me. He's trying to win it back. I said, listen, if you went up to Stark, Stark is where the electric chair is in the state of Florida. Can you see Jesus pulling the lever and killing somebody? And he said, yeah. And I said to him, I guess we just have to agree to disagree because that's not the Jesus that I read about in Scripture. But please hear me, I'm not talking about the issue. Please don't email me. Do not send me anonymous notes. I don't read them. I don't read them. We throw them away. I'm telling you, please, if you want to disagree with me, please disagree. That's great. I'm glad you disagree. But put your name in it so we can talk about it because we're friends. Okay, I love you. You love me. I hope you love me. Okay? And I love most of you. No, I love all of you. So, (laughs) except Paul Martella. But, um... So so stay with me. Remember last week I said that we're talking about how God's will never violates his character. Remember last week I said that that, um, the Bible teaches that Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine, and there's mystery to that. Listen to what Colossians says. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So when I'm trying to determine whether something is God's will, I can't ascribe that thing to God if I can't see Jesus in it. Do you remember the old bracelets we used to wear? WWJD, what did that stand for? What would would Jesus do? That's not a bad question to ask ourselves when we're discerning God's will. So if we're even talking about a natural disaster, a hurricane slamming into the coast, did Jesus cause that? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that God's will will ever violate God's character, his nature. But there's one more thing. Remember, I told you this is going to be a thinking sermon, so I need you to think carefully with me. God's will is multifaceted. It's multifaceted. Now, here's what I mean by that. Um, If I asked you to give me the definition of love, there's probably 500 people in church this morning, we'd probably get like 400 answers, right? Because love is multifaceted. It's like a diamond. You look at it at different angles and, and you can see different things about it. And so when we talk about God's will, it's multifaceted. So the prophet Isaiah invites us into a conversation that he's having with God. Listen to what God says to Isaiah. Isaiah 
55, verses 8 and 9. Read this with me. Ready? Go. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, God is echoing what Paul said. He's kind of saying, God's God, we're not, be humble. But does it mean that we're lost? Well, no, the Bible doesn't want us to be lost. The Bible wants us to be found, not just once, but throughout our journey with him. And so we need some help in discerning these indiscernible thoughts of God. So this week I went to some folks that are a lot smarter than me. I went to a book that was written back in the 1940s by a guy by the name of Leslie Weatherhead. It was simply titled The Will of God. Just a little short book. You can get it on Kindle. You can download it, read it this week in like, like, like an hour. And in his little book, The Will of God, now remember, he writes this book during the Nazi occupation of Germany and much of Europe. And people are wondering, what was God's will as they're dropping bombs on London where he's a pastor? So he's trying to stand for God in the midst of a huge amount of crisis that's going on in his world. It's complex times. And he says, we need to understand God in three different ways. I'm going to go through this real quick. And here they are. They're on the screen. He says, we need to understand the intentional will of God, the circumstantial will of God, and the ultimate will of God. The intentional will circumstantial and ultimate. Now I'm going to go through these real quick. Let me tell you what the intentional will of God is according to Dr. Weatherhead. He says it's the way God intended the world to be. When you read Genesis 1 and 2, everything is good. All things are working right. You know, we love God. We love one another. This is all before sin enters into the game. It's the way God created the creation to live out in holiness and in innocence. This is the way we were made. But he says then there is this thing called the circumstantial will of God. And the circumstantial will of God is when our sinful ways, our evil ways, invade and infect God's intentional will. So let me give you an example. Is it God's intentional will that we have sent from this church a dozen or more young men and young women off to battle in another country? I don't think it's God's intentional will. I think we live in a planet where we go to war, and so part of God's circumstantial will might be that some of our young men and women have prayed and gone off to serve their country. You see, we've got to distinguish between what is it that God's intended and what, because we live in a broken world, happens. We live in a broken world where disease happens. It's not God's intentional will. It's a part of the circumstances of the world that we live in. But then Dr. Weatherhead says there is the ultimate will of God. And this is what helps us. This is what gives us hope because we know at the end of time God will redeem everything and God will put right that which is wrong. And this gives us hope. And what Dr. Weatherhead says is that when we use all three of these words to talk about the will of God, we sometimes confuse them. So, He writes this. Now remember, he's writing this during Nazi Germany's occupation. He says this. When a young missionary declares his readiness and determination, having been thoroughly tested and having passed the necessary necessary examinations to give his life in order to bring the good news about Jesus to people who've never heard it, then we can truly say, thy will be done. But not when an airman is brought down in flames to meet an untimely death. But when war is over, and young men of all nations can shake hands and begin building a new world together, that's time to say, thy will be done. You see, um, we live in a world where bad things happen. We just just do. Now, let me make it a little more personal. I want to invite the worship band to make their way up here. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there's some of you came to church this morning, and, and you, you see, you, you hear this message, and what my hope is, is that you're going to find some comfort in it. But as I was praying this morning, what came to mind for me, I watched a couple of weeks back 
when this stage was filled with, you remember when the Vacation Bible School kids were here? Do you remember what their theme was? Trust God. Trust God. Just trust God. Here's the deal. We have to learn to trust God. When it comes to God's will for our life, we have to learn to trust God. There's an old song, one of my favorites, that says uh, that, that when you can't see his hand and when you can't trace his plan, you have to trust his heart, God's heart. So you remember the night that Jesus was gathered with his disciples in the upper room and then they made their way, uh, Jesus made his way off to pray and he took Peter and James and John with him? So Jesus makes his way off, and he's, and he's going to pray, and, and he leaves Peter, James, and John, and he says to them, now you guys, go, you guys go and you pray for me. And he goes a little bit further, and the Bible says that Jesus fell to the ground, and he began to pray blood-dropped prayers. And remember what Jesus said? I'll give you my translation. Jesus said, Daddy, if there's another way, If there's another way. I, I know the circumstances are that unless I, the perfect Lamb of God, go to the cross and have my body broken and bruised and battered for a sinful humanity, there is no other way. But God, if there is any other way, then Daddy, please, show me the way. And then resolve came into the master's heart. And Jesus, our rabbi, with the weight of the world literally on his body, Jesus said from the well of his trust in his Abba, Father, Papa, Jesus said, but Father, not my will, but your will be done. follow our rabbi. We follow our master. And we say, God, if there's another way. I don't know why I'm going through this, God, but if there's another way, would you make it clear? But at the end of the day, God, all I can say is not my will, but your will be done. I want to invite you to follow Jesus. I will be done. Let's stand for prayer. Father, this morning, I know that there are probably some of us, I know there are some, many of us who kind of harbor bitterness and resentment and maybe even anger towards you. And I pray that God today, as we just sing this love song that reminds us that you're the God who's in control. you're working all things for our good. Not that everything is good, but you're the God who works all things for good. We make this God a song of surrender to you. We lift our voice in our heart. This is our prayer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody agreeing said.